All right, well, let's, um, let's begin by reading Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12, which is the Sermon on the Mount uh, in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. And essentially, we're going to work our way through these things, and I think I may even just talk about the connection between these and the last, um, uh, well, the, the following three verses, which would be 13 through, actually, there's four verses in the 13 through 16. But let me read for you verses 1 through 12, and again, we're going to look at the Beatitudes in general and two of them in particular. We read beginning in verse 1, When Jesus saw the crowds, <clears throat> he went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. He opened his mouth and began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Well, may the Lord bless his word to our hearing. Uh, we're dealing mainly with verses um, 3 and, and 4 this morning. Now, just backing up a little bit, we've, we have been reminded, uh, reminded lately that we are called to be like Jesus. That's the reason God saved us, so that He might be the firstborn among many brethren who are like Him. I mean, that's, that's the purpose of redemption, to make us like Jesus, that we would be like Him, that, that kind of character, live that kind of life. And we also noted that we're never more like Jesus than when we share the gospel. I mean, Jesus' whole life, if you were to characterize it by any one thing, wouldn't it be evangelism? He was always reaching out, always teaching, always preaching the gospel, promoting it in absolutely every way that He could living that there might be a gospel, and dying that he might bring salvation to as many as would believe. Now, if God saved us to make us like Jesus, how can we really have any other goal, any other purpose in life than to be like him? And how could we really focus on anything uh, more than evangelism? Now, we saw last week that Jesus does not expect us to transform ourselves into his image. We don't have that ability to do that in and of ourselves. He has given us his Holy Spirit. Now, God originally did make us like him at creation. He made us to be thinking and willing or purposeful creatures, moral creatures, immortal creatures, it, it occurred to me, I've never heard it actually expressed this way, but it, it occurred to me that what he made us like at creation, what he made Adam and Eve like, were like Jesus, perfect humanity. And the fact is we still are made in the image of God. We still bear that image even after the fall. But as we saw last week, we did lose something that was very, very precious. We lost his moral likeness, his love for what is good and what is right, because we lost His Spirit. In other words, we may share now the humanity of Jesus Christ, but we don't share the heart of Jesus. We don't have His image. We are no longer like Him in that we come into the world evil. We no longer want to do what He calls us to do. As a matter of fact, we want to do just the opposite of what He tells us to do. But that's why Jesus came into the world, in order to bring the Spirit back to us through His work, to give Him to us so that we could become like Him again. And remember the work that Jesus did on the cross, which you know, we would say, I think, by today's 
calculations was in 30 AD applied both directions. It applied to those who trusted Jesus before he came into the world as they looked forward to him through the, prom the promises and the prophecies uh, and, and really all the different types and shadows that God gave in the Old Testament. It applies after Jesus came into the world to those who look back to the cross and who trust in the one who not only died but rose again from the dead in order to save those who believe. We saw that he saved Adam and Eve. He applied it backwards. He restored the Spirit of God to them. And with the Spirit, their likeness to Jesus. And again, he does that for everybody who trusts in the Lord Jesus. The Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. doesn't mean believe the facts about Jesus, believe he lived and he died, that those things are true. You have to believe those things, but you actually need to rely upon him, look to him to save you, rely upon him, trust him to get you into heaven by what he has done. That's what it means to trust him. And if you are really trusting him, then of course you will also follow him. You'll turn from your sins and you will do what he calls you to do. But now we also noted that he did something more in the new covenant than he did in the old covenant before the cross and even before the day of Pentecost. And we noted the reason is likely because of the difference in the way evangelism is conducted. In the Old Testament, it was magnetic evangelism. Basically, there was a magnet in Israel, in Palestine, and if you wanted to learn about God, if you wanted to become one of his people, you had to go there, and you had to join yourself to those people there and worship with them there. But since Jesus has come into the world, there's no longer one country on earth where you need to go and learn about and worship the true God. Evangelism has now become radiant. Jesus sends us out to make disciples of all the nations. And that is a far larger task than just simply waiting around for somebody to come to you and to ask you about how to worship the true God. And to strengthen us to do this, he gives us more of his Holy Spirit to empower us. And he empowers us by strengthening our desire to do that work. I mean, let's face it, if you don't want to do it, nothing is going to drag you out of your chair to get you to do it. It has to come from within. So he gives us the desire, and that moves us to do what he calls us to do. He gives us more of a spirit so that we'll get the gospel out. But there's two things we saw that we needed. We must want to get the gospel out. And of course, we already have this desire if we have the spirit of God living in us, if we're trusting Jesus. But we need to ask also for the fullness of the spirit, the filling of the spirit, the empowering of the Holy Spirit so that we will be able to do it. If we really want to reach others, we need to ask for his help. And if we ask for his help, he'll give it to us because he has promised to give it to us. But if we are to be effective in reaching others, there is something else that we need. And I think we all know that we need this. And we've been talking about it somewhat. Besides the desire, we need character. We need to have a personal kind of witness that shows that the gospel is able to do something that is greater than what's going on in the world. We need Jesus' character. We need to grow more into his image. Now, the indicator that we have the Lord Jesus Christ, that we are saved, that we belong to him, that his spirit is in our hearts, as I've already mentioned, is that we have the desire already to reach out because that's what Jesus would do. The Spirit of God is working His image in us. That's what we'll want to do. But the indicator that we've reached maturity in the Lord Jesus Christ is that we are actually reaching out to others as a normal part of our lives. I mean, everything is to be holiness to the Lord. Everything is to be Christ-centered. Everything is to revolve around the kingdom of heaven. It should influence all of our thoughts, all of our desires, all of our decisions, and particularly to be the kind of witness other people need in order to lead them to the Lord Jesus. Now, to reach that kind of maturity, we need to do what we saw in our meditation this morning. We need to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. But in order to put him on, we need to know what he's like 
so that we know what we need to be aiming at. Now, this morning, we're going to continue to look then at what it means to be like Jesus. But we're going to do it from the Beatitudes because that is really what the Beatitudes are talking about, what Jesus is like. Now, two Wednesdays ago, Dr. Ferguson was dealing with the Beatitudes in his series on the Sermon on the Mount. And what he said there was very helpful. I think we saw that it was very good, and I think we all appreciated that. But Henry pointed out something that was very important. One thing that Dr. Ferguson didn't do was actually explain what the Beatitudes mean. Okay? So I thought it would be helpful for us to do that. Now, he did have a lot of ground to cover. You know, 23 minutes, I think, are the typical length of his lectures. And he was dealing with this whole section that I read, verses really one, I think he actually went all the way through um, verse 16. Uh, it's hard to cover that much ground uh, in 23 minutes. Uh, but he, he just touched lightly on it, but sort of gave a lot of background that was very helpful. So what I thought I would do then is try to deal with them with a little more depth, which is what we're going to do today, and then not next Lord's Day because Bob Needham is going to be ministering next Lord's Day, but then the Lord's Day after that will conclude to, to see really what these are telling us about Jesus, what the Spirit of God is doing within us to make us like Jesus, and what it is we should be aiming at in the Christian life. Now, this morning we're going to look at the first two, and again, I'll give you some of those insights that Ferguson gave and probably some that he didn't, but uh, hopefully things that will help us understand these better. And then this evening we'll look at the second two. So first of all, let's review some things that will help us better understand the Beatitudes. Now, the first is what we've just heard. The Beatitudes actually are describing to us Jesus. And I think sometimes we don't look at them that way. We look at them as things that He's doing in us, and certainly there are applications in us that will be different than they would be in Jesus. But this is the image of Jesus that's being explained here. They describe Him. He is the one who ultimately is the one who is blessed. He is the one who has earned these blessings that come from being this kind of person. Remember how each of these talks about the blessing of being a certain way, but then it talks about why they're blessed, because they receive these certain things, the kingdom of heaven, uh, comfort, inherit the earth, and so forth. We need to understand that, that those things are the things that Jesus has actually earned because he is this kind of person. And he's the only one who has ever been exactly like this. Now, secondly, they describe what the Spirit of God has done in us and is doing in us. The desires that he puts in us when he brought us to the Lord Jesus Christ, that's describing the qualities that he is working in us. Now, we might say from that perspective that these beatitudes are really marks of grace there are some of the ways that we can know that the Spirit of God is living savingly inside of us when we see these things actually in our lives. Now, thirdly, since all of these things come from uh, the Holy Spirit, uh, whose, whose work it is to make us more like Jesus, okay? And since... They are characteristics which the Lord Jesus possessed. They also come as, as a set. They, we either have all of them or we don't really have uh, any of them. We, we really can't have some without the others any more than, than Jesus could. Okay? The, the whole image of Jesus is being formed in us. Now, we don't have any of these things as perfectly as, as Jesus did, so we still won't be exactly like him, but there will be something, we will be something like him. Now, fourthly, because this work isn't complete and because we're not exactly like him, because we are called to put on the Lord Jesus Christ, there are also goals, or these are also goals that we should be aiming at. Okay, we, we are this way, but we need to become uh, more 
like this. Now, fifthly, the blessings that are mentioned for each of these Beatitudes I've already mentioned, the kingdom of heaven, comfort, inheriting the earth, being satisfied with righteousness and so forth, are really all descriptions of what Jesus has earned. They all have to do with his kingdom, with his inheritance. And so what we will inherit with him if we have trusted him and if we are following him. Okay, so just backing up and again re reviewing those few things, these are describing Jesus. These are describing what the Spirit of God is doing in us. These are the things that come collectively as a set. They should all be true of us. Unless they are all true of us, really none of them are true of us. These are things that we should be pursuing. And if we have these things, we are blessed because it shows we belong to Jesus and belonging to him, we will inherit all the blessings that he has earned. Now, let me just step back and say one more thing about them before we look at the first two. And that is what Ferguson pointed out. What Jesus is really saying here, and this is very important, he's telling us that grace comes before obedience. Jesus is dealing with what must be true of us before we're going to be able to do what he calls us to do. But we don't make ourselves this way. This is something he gives to us. Grace, or the free gift of God, comes before obedience. We don't obey the law of God in order to receive God's grace. Salvation doesn't come by keeping God's commandments. We don't earn it by what we do. He gives us grace so that we might obey the law. Remember, salvation is by grace through faith alone. It's a free gift. And it was something earned by Jesus and something he gives to us freely. And he offers to us freely if we're willing to accept it. Remember, he went out preaching, you know, repent and believe. Anyone who is hungry, anyone who is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. If anyone is weary or heavy laden, come to me and I will give you rest. Jesus was continually offering himself to others, encouraging them to come. And he said, the one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out, I will certainly not repel. You are all welcome to come. He has earned it. He gives it as a free gift. He offers it as a free gift. But to be free to us, we have to simply receive it by faith as a free gift. But the evidence that we've received it is this change, this change that we see in the Beatitudes, that we now want, or now are the kind of person who wants to obey the commandments. It's now in our heart to do it, and we're going to see that as we go through these things. Now again, the very next thing that Jesus talks about in the Sermon on the Mount is how important the law of God is. He didn't come to obey it so he could just throw it, throw it aside. He didn't come to abolish it. He came to fulfill it that if we would ever hope to enter his kingdom Jesus says that we must obey and that our obey our our obedience must be better than it was for the religious elite of his day the scribes and the Pharisees so Jesus says until heaven and earth pass away not one jot or tittle shall pass away from the law until everything is accomplished I haven't come to abolish the law I've come to fulfill it whoever then teaches or annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others will be called least in the kingdom, but whoever keeps and teaches them shall be called great. For I say to you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, he says you will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now Jesus goes on to talk about how our obedience needs to be better than theirs. Basically he says... They were going through the motions, acting like righteous people, but they didn't really want to obey from within. We have to want to obey the law of God in our hearts. We want to, should want to keep the commandments in our minds, not break them in our imaginations, not use our words to hurt other people but build them up. In other words, we need to keep the commandments beyond just acting like we are, we need actually to love them and to desire to keep them 
and actually to keep them in everything that we do, in our thoughts, in our words, and in our actions. That's how our obedience has to go beyond the obedience of the scribes and the Pharisees who were the most religious people of their day. But the question is, how can we go beyond what the scribes and the Pharisees actually accomplished? They're very scrupulous. Well, again, Jesus' point is we can't by ourselves, but we can by His Holy Spirit. And that's why grace comes before obedience. This is what He came to give us, as we mentioned, the, the, to restore the moral image of God to, in, in, in our souls, to give us the Holy Spirit. That is the blessing of the new covenant, to give us the ability to love or to obey in this way. The Spirit gives us a new heart. He gives us the things that we see here in the Beatitudes. He gives us the heart of Jesus. So that's the background to the Beatitudes. And again, it tells us grace, the grace of God comes before obedience. The image of Christ is formed in us before we will want to begin to obey the Lord. So what we need to do, of course, is look to see whether that image is actually being formed in us. If, if it is, we belong to him. If it is, we are blessed because the blessing he promises belongs to us through Jesus and what he did and not through our works. So with this in mind, let's consider the first, be, the first two Beatitudes uh, briefly. The first two characteristics the Spirit of God has put into our hearts to make us more like Jesus. We're going to look at two, humility and grief for sin. Now, first, Jesus says in verse 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, this phrase, poor in spirit, means humility. He, he means, blessed are you when you are not full of yourself, but when you are emptied of self, when you become humbled and lowly. Now, again, I've told you, these are descriptions of Jesus. And this was certainly true of him. This is how he came into the world. Paul tells us that being in the form of God, having infinite majesty and glory, riches untold, power, you know, just everything you would think of to the superlative, he emptied himself, not by giving up that deity, but by taking to himself our humanity and becoming a lowly, and a, and a humble servant. Now listen again to what Paul writes about Jesus emptying of himself in Philippians chapter 2, remembering that he did this not only to save us, not only to show us what he wants us to do as an example to us, but he did this to make us like this, to make us like him, to work from the inside out. He writes in Philippians 2 verses 5 and 8, Paul says to the Philippians, have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So here is the, the ultimate example of self-emptying, of self-abasing, of humiliation. We, we talk about two aspects of our Lord Jesus' work. The first is His humiliation. He, he empties Himself. He comes down from heaven, takes on our nature, takes the form of a servant, and in that form, He humbles himself to serve us to the point of death. And then we talk about his exaltation because he humbled himself so much. He was exalted to the place of greatest authority and greatest power. Our Lord Jesus tells us that when he came into this world in Matthew 20, verse 28, that he did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Uh, Ferguson noted in the uh, Upper Room Discourse uh, those last few hours Jesus spent with his disciples before he went to the cross, that before the Last Supper, he was the one who stooped and served his disciples. He is the one who stooped to wash their feet. And he's also the one who, who stooped 
and bowed his head to yield up his spirit and die in order to wash them and cleanse them of their sins. And he has done that for us as well on the cross. The Bible says that Jesus was rich, but he became poor for our sakes so that through his poverty, we might become rich. And it was for this that he was exalted. Again, Paul continues in Philippians 2, verses 9 through 11. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, we noted earlier that Jesus said that we cannot enter the kingdom of heaven unless our righteousness is greater than that of the scribes and the Pharisees. Well, it's equally true that we're, our righteousness is not going to exceed theirs, and therefore we're not going to enter the kingdom of heaven unless we are poor in spirit. That must be true of us. Unless we humble ourselves uh, and admit our spiritual poverty in, in the sight of God, our guiltiness and our sinful heart, we're never actually going to come to Jesus to receive his forgiveness and his mercy. And unless we humble ourselves and acknowledge that he is the Lord, we're never actually going to submit to Jesus in the way we should. We're never going to be useful to him in serving and helping one another to be the best that we can be in, in the Lord Jesus or in helping those who are outside the church, who are lost, find their way to him. We have to be poor in spirit. And so this is what Jesus actually gives us by his Holy Spirit. Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, not poor in the Holy Spirit, but poor in our own spirit, who are humble. It's only this way that we can actually have this characteristic by the Spirit. And when we have it, Jesus says, we are blessed. We're blessed because this is the evidence that we belong to him. But we're also blessed because belonging to him, we are the heirs of the kingdom of heaven. Jesus says in verse 3, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven, the eternal kingdom of heaven, that which exists now in this world and that which will exist forever, we're a part of it. It belongs to us. We are the heirs of the Lord Jesus Christ. So how do we know that we're the heirs of the kingdom? We know because we have this humility. But again, we don't have it like Jesus had. It's not perfect in us, but we are something like Jesus in this way. And having this particular quality of the Spirit, having the beginnings of it, we need to grow in it if we are to become more like Jesus. Remember, Jesus is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven because he was the one who humbled himself to become the least, the servant of all. Jesus tells us that if we are to be great in his kingdom, we also must strive to be the least. So he gives us that humility. But having that humility, we need to strive to humble ourselves even more to be the servant of all. Mark writes in Mark 9, verse 35, sitting down, he called the twelve and he said to them, if anyone wants to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. That's the way it is in, in God's kingdom. So he gives us this by the Spirit and he tells us pursue this even more. And we have the ability to do that by his Holy Spirit. So blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Secondly, Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Now, the word mourn means to be grieved. It means to be sad. But the interesting thing here is Jesus does not actually tell us what it is we're supposed to be mourning and grieving specifically. I mean, does Jesus mean that we are to be grieved over the fact that we look around and we see so many people blessed with so many things, so many people have so much, but we don't have very much, and so we should be grieved about that? Well, actually, no, because remember the psalmist was lamenting the fact that, that he, life was tough for him, but the rich seemed to be prospering. But then he went into the temple of God and he saw the end of the rich 
they were receiving their comfort in full here. But after this life, they would have to pay for their sins. Whereas he belonged to the Lord and he would be blessed. Are we supposed to be grieved that we don't look as beautiful or as handsome as, as others? That we don't have the talents that make us stand head and shoulders above everyone, everyone else like the celebrities? Or that we don't have greater natural gifts that would help us make our mark in history? You know, uh, I'll be remembered for this or for that. Or as maybe it's we should be grieved over the fact that we don't have, share the same health that other people share or don't have the strength that they have or the abilities that they have. Well, actually, you know what? Jesus doesn't mean any of those things because those things mean nothing to him. These are the things he gives to those who ultimately will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. As a matter of fact, he gives more of those things. In the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, when Lazarus, or I should say the rich man was in hell suffering, Abraham from heaven says to him, you received your good things, you received your comfort in full, and now you're tormented. And yet Lazarus now is being comforted. He was poor on earth, but now he's being comforted in heaven. The rich man was rich, and now he's being tormented, not for his riches, but basically he received everything the Lord had to give him in this life, and now he had to pay for his sins there, whereas Lazarus the things that God had for him were stored up for the life which is to come. God gives what the world considers to be, you know, valuable to those who aren't going to inherit the kingdom of heaven more than he gives it to those who are going to inherit the kingdom of heaven. So this is not what we are to be grieving over. What Jesus means is to be grieved over the, the one thing, the only thing that should actually grieve us, and that is our sins and the sins of others, and the consequences that sin brings, not only on us, but on others. Now, we know that our Lord Jesus Christ didn't have any personal sin. He was perfect, and so he did not grieve over any sins that had to do with him. But he did grieve over the sins of his disciples. He grieved over the sins of those around him on numerous occasions. We read in Mark's gospel that when Jesus was in a synagogue and he saw a man with a withered hand... He asked the Pharisees whether it was lawful to do good on the Sabbath. And when they didn't answer, we read in Mark 3, verse 5, after looking around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored. When Jesus saw the unbelief of the Jews who had come to comfort Mary and Martha over the loss of their brother Lazarus, and I, we don't think this is the same Lazarus that was in the parable, but he was grieved when he looked around them, and he mourned their lack of faith. The, the sins of others, and what Jesus knew would be the consequences of those sins, which ultimately is, is God's wrath in, in hell forever, unless they repent and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ, those things made him mourn. They made him weep. They made him grieve. Jesus had a heart that, was, that cared about other people. He knew the consequences of sin. Now, the Spirit works the same kind of grief, the same kind of mourning over sin in our souls. When he raised us to spiritual life, we have this in us. When he gives us love for what is good, it causes us to grieve over evil. You know, the evil that um, is in our own hearts, the evil that we see in the people all around us, and what we know is going to be the consequences of that evil. So here's another way we can gauge whether or not the Spirit of God is actually in our hearts, whether or not we're being made into the image of Jesus, because is that what we're experiencing? Are we mourning and grieving over our own sins and imperfections? Are we mourning and grieving over the sins of others, not standing up and condemning them, but, as we're going to see a little bit later, showing mercy towards them, being concerned for them, and wanting to reach out to them to help them overcome these sins, to be cleansed of that guilt, and to have the power to obey? You know, do we have that kind of heart? If you do, then you are blessed. 
because this kind of grief, this kind of mourning is really the evidence that your sins are actually forgiven. And that can bring tremendous comfort. Jesus does say here, blessed are those who are mourn, or who, who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Now let's not forget that even though we grieve over our sins, we don't mourn over them the way we should. The more we grieve, or the more our sins grieve us, the more we will turn from them. And the more that the sins of others grieve us and we mourn over them, the more we are going to do to try and reach them. So we need to pray that the Lord would strengthen this particular grace in our hearts, actually both of these, make us poor in spirit, make us humble, not so full of ourselves that we're seeking our own glory, but rather humble servants who are seeking His glory. And we need to mourn over our sins so that we'll turn away from them to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to mourn and grieve over the sins of others so that we'll reach out to them with the gospel. The stronger these qualities are in us, the more we will do for the Lord's glory. Now this evening we're going to consider two more Beatitudes, blessed are the gentle and blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. But for now, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to help us search our hearts with regard to humility and whether or not we're mourning and grieving our sins as we prepare to come to the table of the Lord. Uh, before we do come to the Lord, we'll spend just a little bit of time uh, reflecting on what Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 11. But for now, let's, let's just ask the Lord to apply what we've heard uh, to our lives. Let's pray.